SU Odyssey simulcast 2 begins now. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Wow. Big news, big news, big news. Eric Gilbert officially opts out of the 2020 season. There was a chance, potentially, we could have convinced him to stay, play out the last two games. But once it became knowledge that this was the path he was taking, it became quite obvious that this was going to happen. Uh, Eric Gilbert is a great, great player, great young man. I expect him to return to LSU. I don't, I don't think he's going to find better out there. At the same time, Clemson looks attractive with, with their quarterback. I dare you to pronounce his name. Um, you know, Georgia does not look uh, like a significant pull for him. I'm not sure about JT Daniels' eligibility if he has, I mean, obviously he'll have at least one year left. Um, but uh, Eric Gilbert came to LSU thanks to John DeCoster and Joe Brady's recruitment. You know, Steve Ensminger as well. Um, but now, as he's here, he's under Derek Shea, tight ends coach. <laughs> he's having Scott Linehan run him into these crazy, ridiculous routes where just complete dinosaur, brontosaurus offense. It's just... I wrote a piece today, well, I should say last night, that was... I think one of the best ones we've ever written. All off season, all during the season, we came up with as many, not excuses, but explanations for why LSU were playing and performing the way they were. Why the mindset was there. Why this and this was happening. Why this opt-out was going down. And why... It wasn't that big of a deal. Why LSU would be just fine. Well, once you lose to Nick Saban like that, I put my foot down. I put my foot down. Okay? That's not LSU football. Losing 55 to 17, 45 points in the first half, 470 yards in the first half, a single player almost amassing 300 total yards. I mean, I know John Rice Plumley tore LSU a new asshole last year, but this was an altogether new brand of sodomy. This was just, this was savage. And, uh, I don't even think the savagery was really in the score or the yards or the plays Alabama put up. I think the savagery was in the plays and the points and the yards that they didn't put up. It was in the the plays that they resisted calling. It was in the fact that they called the same offense that Missouri did. Eli Drinkwitz. Literally the same offense that Eli Drinkwitz destroyed us with. They literally were calling those same pick plays, crossing routes, you name it. They were calling, whoa, ah, ah, ah. Oh, sweet. Okay. Oh. What happened there? Oh, wait, shoot, my phone's going off. Oh, is that... Oh, okay. I thought it was another opt-out. <sighs> just, just a, just a text. Okay, um, what, where were we? Uh, yeah, um, I put my foot down when you lose to Sabin like that. Um, 
You can't lose to Saban like that and expect to continue on uh, the 2019 path. The whole 2019 path, the whole 2019 message going forth was that this is a new era, that Alabama wasn't the sheriff in the SEC West anymore. LSU were the new chiefs in town. LSU were going to have... uh, Rivers, come on. LSU were going to have dominance and... and, uh, Maybe not beat Alabama every year, but at least push Bama to the brink every year and beat them, you know, at least every other year, every, you know, three out of five years, you know. It wasn't Alabama is going to be no more. It was that we're going to gradually take this crown from you with what we're building. And that's going to be done through CFP appearances. It's going to be done through beating you and taking you out of the SEC championship. All sorts of things like that. And um, I look at what the future holds right now for LSU. And I'm talking about big picture long term. I'm talking about two or three years from now. And right now, with what's currently going on, you cannot say that everything looks fine, that everything looks like once we weather the 2020 storm, 2021 will come in and clean everything out and cleanse and LSU and everything will be fine. No. the Nothing will be fine with LSU football, LSU athletics, or the university until whoever covered up these rapes, whoever covered up these allegations of these rapes and these domestic violence beatings of women by people like Darius Geis, by punks like uh, Drake Davis, by, uh, you know, Ray Parker, who shouldn't have even been on the football team considering his history of attacking women. Um, LSU did not even know this history. They, they, they dug so deep as much as they could in his recruitment But sometimes what we've come to find is these abusers of women are chameleons on college campuses. They walk around with big smiles on their faces because they're the kings of the campus, and no one's the wiser. They think, well, he could get any girl he he wants, you know. Any girl is going to want to be with him, of course. And so when it becomes a a rape allegation, it becomes, well, no, (laughs) no. You're going to say that that happened by Darius Geis? Like, of course you would want to be with Darius Geis. Of course you want to be with Drake Davis. So, so that makes no sense, you know, that type of thinking. And because of that type of thinking, rape culture has been able to explode across every single college in this country. And I don't know why it's become such a almost like a joke to to college-age kids. Um, I'll, I'll, I've seen videos of, from parties where they're all, you know, making jokes about rape, where they're making jokes about drugging people and drugging women's drinks. And whether or not that's happening, you know, in the videos itself that are being posted or the jokes or the memes or... You know, whether those people really believe that type of stuff, who knows. But the problem is that they're putting that crap out there. And they're perpetuating that type of uh, culture. I don't think that's LSU's culture. I'm going to just tell you that right here, right now. That is not LSU's culture. Not under Ed Orgeron. And, you know, it probably was under Les Miles. It seemed like Les Miles... Joe Oliva, F. King Alexander, those three just ruled with an iron fist. And it seemed like if they let anybody on that on that staff in the athletic department, it was by their way and their way only. Certain habits were ingrained during that time of, of silence, of, of, of potentially hiding and covering up uh, allegations. And this is, we're talking... You know, in the early 2010s, we're talking up to 2016 with Les Miles on as coach. 
and Joe Oliva, who is a near criminal athletic director. I mean, this guy, <clears throat> this guy was horrible. I mean, he took he took LSU to a national championship game as an athletic director, but that meant nothing. Um, it's it was absolutely ridiculous how he has gotten away with what he has gotten away with. Same thing with Les Miles. While uh, Coach Ed Orgeron is having to answer the tough questions or, you know, not answer them, just at least be asked them and put under that pressure, he's, ha he's having to answer questions about eras that don't pertain to him. The Drake Davis situation... Grant Delpit and, and uh, Jacob Phillips, ask away. That is under Coach Orgeron's purview. You know, but they don't ask about the Ed Ingram case. They don't want to talk about that. And I find that interesting. Because the Ed Ingram case shows Coach Orgeron believing victims without hesitation and dismissing a very highly valued, highly recruited freshman offensive ta offensive guard, Ed Ingram. And Ed Ingram was charged with two counts of aggravated sexual assault, both felonies in Texas. Um, it is also part of LSU's policy to dismiss any player charged with a felony. They dismissed him for both reasons, of course. And, uh, you know, Orgeron, he believed the victims here. And uh, he, he, he acted on that. And it just shows, because uh, a year later, Ed Ingram's name was cleared, the charges were dismissed, and he's still on the football team and will probably be playing in the NFL soon enough because he's that good. And it's turned out that, you know, Ed Ingram's actually a really good guy. I've spoken with him. He's a very, very nice guy. He's he's, he's one of the most cordial people on the LSU football team, at least that I've spoken to. Very, very, very nice guy. And it's just, it's an interesting situation because I feel like there's so many layers to this. Uh, Coach Orgeron... I, as much as I feel like he he is not to blame for the culture that has soured, that I feel like he is not to blame for the toxicity that has happened because of 2020 and the, the, the opt-outs and the, the stopped disrupted practices, the non-stop uh, testing, all the, you know, the isolation, the mental health issues from that isolation that these players are going through, all these different factors. I don't put them completely on Coach Order on whatsoever. What I do put on Coach Orgeron is the reaction to these incidents, the reaction to these scenarios, the reaction to this. It seemed like Coach Orgeron's greatest skill was to react, to overcome, and to overpower, overwhelm uh, the doubts, and and take a, take what's his. Take a take the team to the highest level, but instead, Rivers always barking at the postman. Rivers, come here, buddy. Come here. Coach Orderon. Coach Orderon. See, you got water poured on you. <laughs> As it happens. Only way to stop a barking dog sometimes, put a little water on him. But yeah, um, I don't think Coach Orgeron is the one to completely blame for all this. I just think he's the one to blame for the reactions to this. Um, he needs to be stronger. He needs to be bolder. When uh, the social injustice was going on in the summer at its peak, and Orgeron had multiple chances to not just say, well, racism, we got to be done with that, we got to stamp racism out of society, he needed to be stronger, he needed to be intense, like everyone knew that wasn't Coach Orgeron at his most enthusiastic, 
his most enthusiastic. He's bumping around. He's flying around. He's buoyant. This was almost like homework. And <laughs> you don't need to. You didn't need to be a minority or or a black person to to sense that. Um, it felt like there was an un, uh, just like a fear to be even in that position. And I think that's kind of, you know, part of an old school way of thought. But what's part of his, you know, what makes Orgeron such an interesting guy is he's not completely old school. He's been very new school in a lot of different ways. The way he treats recruits, the way he handles their families, the way he really goes above and beyond. But I need to see him go above and beyond against sexual assault at LSU. I need to see him speak out. I know that he may not legally be able to say everything he might want to or, or, or everything he could, but he needs to say a lot more than just, I can't, I can't speak about that. He needs to be stronger. Um, he needs to go to Tom Galligan, to Woodward, and say, right now, right now, we need to get rid of the people who participated in this cover-up. And they need to start being out, shown the door right now. And until that happens, LSU may not win a game. And until that happens, there's going to be so much uncertainty around LSU until this is cleared up. Because this, it's everything right now. It's the reason this is happening. Go Tigers! LSUodyssey.com Simulcast 2 signing out. <laughs> ah!